Hey everyone, welcome back. Last time we talked about what meritocracy is, its implications, and what the result of meritocratic thought has meant for higher education and for politics. This time we're going to take a bit of a closer look at how this is affecting real people. Before I start, it's important to go back and watch the last episode before this one, as I'll be referencing it a few times in this episode. Also, just in general, Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, Ramadan, and New Year. And if it so suits you, Happy Holidays. Also because the supermarkets have started selling hot cross buns already, apparently, so Happy Easter. Right, without any more ado, let's get straight into it. Part 1. Despair amongst the working class. When we talk about the working class, certain things leap to mind, especially in the US and the UK. Usually we are talking about poorer, more conservative, and less educated people, often in rural areas. It is also generally believed that these people are less sympathetic to sufferers of mental illness and are more likely to be devoutly religious and deeply racist. These are stereotypes, but that's not to say they are entirely wrong. The new focus on credentials and education that meritocracy has brought has hugely affected poorer communities, typically of white, working-class people. In the US, Republicans are far less credentialed as a group than Democrats, which as frequently pointed out in the last episode, doesn't mean they are less moral or less intelligent. It just means that fewer of them have been to college, and they usually occupy a much more physical, lower-skilled, working-class job. But even then, I bet a whole lot of you felt a tinge of superiority just then. It's easy to feel superior to people who aren't credentialed when you live in this place. So much of our lives revolve around work, and education helps us have better jobs, earn more money, and with it, more status. So when it comes to unemployment, the inverse is often true. Always remember that it's easy not to care about people losing their jobs, especially if they are your political enemies, until you lose your job too something which has been happening en masse recently. It's especially easy to say, as someone with secure work, that you need to upskill, get an education, retrain, rejoin the workforce. But these people had jobs, they just weren't efficient enough. As Martin Luther King said, one day our society will come to respect the sanitation workers if it is to survive. For the person who picks up our garbage is in the final analysis as significant as the physician. For if he doesn't do his job, diseases are rampant. All labour has dignity. Many working class people take very much to heart the idea that if they fail, if they lose their job, if they no longer contribute, they have no one to blame but themselves. The dignity of the paycheck is something that, generally speaking, people believe in, especially working men. When conservatives talk about wanting to restore the value of work, what they are talking about, again, is not money. It is a type of social currency. They're talking about merit. These ideas are meritocratic in origin, but they are from a different time. It is a belief in the merit of personal responsibility, living off the land or going to work day in and day out to provide for a family. It's John Steinbeck's imagining of the American dream that so many people lived with for their entire life before it was abruptly cut off by globalization. Incidentally, this is reflected in the conservative ideal that Americans should buy American and impose tax on things bought overseas, have a more closed market, and push back against excessive globalization and immigration. This is in stark contrast to the liberal and capitalist ideal to have more open markets and borders, reduce import taxes, invite global trade, and compete for the lowest prices. If our goal is for the lowest prices for consumers, then immigration, trade, and outsourcing are great ideas. However, if our goal is to create a labor market where low- and middle-skilled citizens can earn a living wage and lead a dignified existence, then restrictions on those things may well be justified. The frustration felt towards elites within the working class has become internalized. Manual work and labor has become so devalued among communities that literally came into existence in order to fulfill those material demands – mining towns, forestry, fishing – that these people feel dislocated from their own existence. That is the very essence of dispensable. Unemployment within the working class demographic is staggeringly high, and increased sharply in the years leading up to 2016 – note the year – at which point 20% of middle-aged working-class white men were unemployed, 
and almost all of them had been unemployed for so long that they had stopped looking for work at all. A severance package is often a great thing economically, but it doesn't do wonders for your self-esteem. It's cheapening. You're being paid out so you don't complain that your job is gone, and often your social standing with it. There is shame in losing your job, even if you had nothing to do with it. Ultimately, working class people would benefit economically from the more left-wing liberal policies, raising the minimum wage, improving social safety nets, for example. But what so many of them feared and still do fear is becoming obsolete, their skills no longer required. They have lived for so long under the idea of contributive work, where their social esteem, and not just income, was dependent on being able to make a difference to someone's life, to contribute to a community that always had work, and always had things that needed doing. Liberal politics does not address this concern. It still says go to college and get a degree, move to a city where the jobs are, and if that job falls through, retrain again. This dismissal goes some way to explaining how Donald Trump was elected. The dividing credentials between people that voted for Trump versus Hillary is stark. It should be noted, however, that Trump's presidency has not helped those who are in pain, those that voted for him. They have not risen with him. These people who were losing their jobs, their way of life, and calling out for help faced another more menacing beast, despair. This is where things get a little bit more serious. White, middle-aged, working-class adults have increasingly been the victims of deaths of despair. That is, suicide and self-harm, alcohol abuse and drug overdose, more so than other groups. It's easy to miss the signs of such loss when you aren't part of these communities, but that doesn't mean they aren't there. More Americans now die from these deaths of despair every two weeks than have been killed in the 19 years of war in Afghanistan and Iraq combined. The increase in these deaths is almost all amongst those without a higher education, those with, say, a four-year bachelor's degree are mostly exempt, and those without any qualifications at all are most at risk. As Case and Deaton conclude in their book Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism, these deaths reflect a long-term and slowly unfolding loss of a way of life for the white, less educated working class. The loss of the working class life and potentially the American dream that went with it is not just socially obscured or dismissed as a side effect of the global economy, it's openly embraced by the same wealthy liberal elites who tout globalization and progress and are political enemies of conservatives. The same people who rightly denounce racism, sexism, and other prejudices show a strong prejudice against the working class themselves. In Educationism and the Irony of Meritocracy, link below, researchers found that more highly educated people are not indeed less biased than less educated people. Their targets of bias are just different. Moreover, while racists, for example, are open and often ashamed and conflicted about their prejudice, the intellectual elite are ready to condemn sexism and racism, but are unapologetic about their prejudice towards less educated people. It is essentially justified in their minds. As law professor Joan Williams notes in her article, The Dumb Politics of Elite Condescension, note the intentional use of the word dumb, too often in otherwise polite society, elites, progressives emphatically included, unselfconsciously belittle working class whites. We hear talk of trailer trash in flyover states afflicted by plumber's butt, open class insults that pass for wit. This condescension affects political campaigns, as in Hillary Clinton's comment about deplorables and Barack Obama's about people who cling to guns or religion. Economic resentment has fueled racial anxiety that, in some Trump supporters and Trump himself, bleeds into open racism. But to write off white working class anger as nothing more than racism is intellectual comfort food, and it is dangerous. Again, we see that framing of the new educated middle and elite as smart citizens, and the working class as dumb rednecks and trailer trash. This socially acceptable dismissal of them as a group that deserves remedy is clearly prejudice. The idea that these people are just stupid and racist, refusing to change with the times they now live in, is part of why Sandel calls credentialism the last acceptable prejudice because this belief is not only widespread, but unapologetic and politely accepted. As I've said, anyone who condemns racism and sexism does so rightly. 
But it's important to understand that both this racist sentiment and the vitriol directed at elites are part of a greater issue. Political scientist Catherine J. Kramer interviewed people in rural Wisconsin for five years to better understand the politics of resentment. Residents of rural communities believe that too much tax money and government attention went to undeserving people. The undeserving included racial minorities on welfare, but it also included lazy urban professionals like me, working desk jobs and producing nothing more than ideas. Racism is part of their resentment, but it is intertwined with a more basic concern, that people like them, in places like theirs, were overlooked and disrespected. Note there the use of the word undeserving. These arguments are still about merit, it's just a different type of merit. They're also about having an opportunity to earn merit in your chosen profession by contributing something useful to someone's life, not by going through higher education, doing something so pointless, so removed from reality that, let's be honest, so many of us do. These people feel overlooked because they are overlooked. Coupled with the deaths of despair the working class now experience, it's really easy to see that this is not an empty complaint. As we award people higher incomes for better jobs and higher social prestige for attending university, we necessarily valorize those achievements. And in doing so, we denigrate those occupations that earn less and require less learning, even if those jobs are essential. Unfortunately, the tide seems to be ebbing more and more in the direction of meritocracy, credentialism, and political partisanship. And as long as it intensifies and continues, people will suffer, be ignored, and potentially die. But it's not just the working class. Part 2. Despair amongst the elite. The undereducated and working class aren't the only ones negatively affected by our system of education, however. In recent times, as education has become more and more relentlessly meritocratic, the standard of education around the world has risen, and so has the expectation placed on students. The extreme helicopter parenting we are seeing now coincides with this newfound meritocratic way of thinking. In fact, the use of parent as a verb has only really been popular since the 70s, when accessible higher education and thus the preparation of children for success became a priority. As psychologist Madeleine Levine writes in her book The Price of Privilege, children of elite professionals suffer under the often unintentionally oppressive hands of their parents. In spite of their economic and social advantages, they experience among the highest rates of depression, substance abuse, anxiety disorders, somatic complaints, and unhappiness of any group of children in this country. When researchers look at kids across the socioeconomic spectrum, they find that the most troubled adolescents often come from affluent homes. In recent times, there has been a massive increase in the amount of money spent on therapy and psychological aid in universities, usually among the most affluent and high-pressure institutions. Sandel points out in his book that at Harvard, the university at which he lectures, times when test results are released are now timed to the availability of therapists on campus to deal with the influx of distressed students and that the time of the release of results is kept intentionally vague because of the increase in stress-induced panic attacks in the time leading up to the announcement. This is an ongoing concern for universities, but it also highlights another way in which parenting has been moulded by meritocratic thinking. The emphasis on being able to do something if you try, and believing that failure is your fault, has infected the minds of parents who want their children to be highly successful. This isn't helped by the growing class divide globally, and in the US especially. If you come from an affluent background, there's much farther to fall now than there ever has been. Perhaps most importantly though, this trend is embedded in children's minds when they are at their most plastic, and many of these parents experienced the same thing when they were growing up. Those who tend the levers and pulleys of the meritocracy machine are not unaware of its human costs. In an honest, insightful essay about the risk of burnout, Harvard College admissions officers worried that those who spend their high school and college years jumping through hoops of high achievement wind up as day survivors of some bewildering lifelong boot camp. The essay, first published in 2000, is still posted as a kind of cautionary tale on the Harvard admissions website. The essay is actually really comforting and reaffirming. I think it's a good thing to keep in mind even if you're not exactly going to Harvard. 
I will link the essay below. It's a short and interesting read. I really recommend you check it out. Here's a quick excerpt. Parents and students alike profit from redefining success as fulfillment of the student's own aims, even those yet to be discovered. Burnout is an inevitable result of trying to live up to alien goals. Time out can promote discovery of one's own passions. The most worrying thing about this cycle of credentialed elites is that they are often affected so deeply by the experiences they have had that they perpetuate the cycle not just with their own children, but with those around them. They internalize that meritocratic belief in credentialism and automatically apply it to everyone. I've often heard it said that neither the elite nor the working class are in the best position. Arguably, the middle class has it best, experiencing perhaps less pressure to perform and more time to consider and redefine their own success, but also not having a whole life of work and social esteem pulled out from under them. Unfortunately, the middle class is shrinking rapidly everywhere, and is still affected by the social mores that restrict those around them. If you were to decide you wanted the life of a working class labourer, you would swiftly be told that you are not only above that, but it's no longer a good job, certainly not a stable job. And with the evidence around you, who could really disagree? That life is gone now. Likewise, if you wanted to study and become one of the academic elite, you would very quickly discover just how hard it is to get into university and how prohibitively expensive it has become. Not to mention that even if you do get in, you are not very likely to rise as far as credentialists would have you believe. That life of affordable education is also gone. There really is no useful comparison between the lives we led just 50 years ago and life today. So many things were so much worse for a lot of people, but many things were also maybe not better, but at least easier to understand and to navigate. The world could be said to be experiencing growing pains. Some people are struggling to find where they fit in and to reconcile their beliefs and desires with the world in which they find themselves and others are letting their beliefs and desires be guided so strictly by that world without even considering what they actually want. Meritocracy and its subsequent teachings have negatively shaped our conception of what people deserve, who belongs where and what is worth striving for. This belief is pervasive and affects all of us. Too often the elite are framed as this perfect section of society with no woes and not a care in the world, just like saying that or trailer trash people are racists and bigots, painting the intellectual elite like this is just not accurate. Part 3. Human worth and what we owe one another. I'm aware that I've somewhat spoken out in, not defense, but sympathy, with two groups of people within the US that many people do not like. On one extreme hand we have lower class white trailer trash racists who voted for Trump, and on the other, we have the political and economic top 10% of society who are very much part of the despicable and unequal economic system that the US now finds itself in. But these people have been suffering in their own way as a result of the meritocratic beliefs of our world. And I'm not sure that sympathy for suffering can ever be a bad thing. We don't live in a complete meritocracy. So we don't have to contend with the issues to the extent that Michael Young described in his book, but if we were to move forward in the same way we currently are, meritocracy could envelop everything. Meritocracy, like many other systems, is not an ideal compatible with intrinsic human worth. By design, it gives us a justified reason for inequality and discrimination. We may perhaps inevitably become stuck in a situation where we must decide in which way we wish our society to be unequal, but I don't think we've quite exhausted our options to the point where this is the best solution. The idea that if you start at the bottom you have nothing to lose, no merit, and that if you start at the top, the potential fall is so precipitous that you will cheat university entry to ensure your children do not lose everything, goes against what many people consider the core values of humanism, that everyone deserves respect because of their human worth, regardless of what they may offer society. Sooner or later, we need to have a conversation about the kind of society we want to live in. There is a silver lining to coronavirus right now, in that we are so rarely given pause to consider the nature of work, education, human worth, success, and a meaningful life. We are rather being forced to take stock right now, but some places more than others. Let's be honest, lots of places aren't even pretending to be locked down. 
Young notes early in his book that a society has emerged that is not an aristocracy of birth, not a plutocracy of wealth, but a true meritocracy of talent. But the more we look into what that means, the clearer it becomes that the latter, whether in its strictest form or in the aspirational form we have today, may be no better than these other forms of society and is sometimes just a more secure and justified version of the former. As politics becomes more divisive and smart and dumb become more legitimate ways of framing debates, it becomes harder and harder to stand in solidarity with the people who aren't like you. Gone it seems are the days when politicians would, or could, do something because they believed it was the right thing to do, not because it was party policy. And unfortunately, the left are there for the left and the right are there for the right. Meritocracy has created a world which is hopeful that things can change and be better, and that we can rise to heights simply not possible in an aristocracy. But unfortunately, that promise of rising is far less likely and more selective than we have been led to believe. Rather than repair the conditions that people want to flee, we construct a politics that makes mobility the answer to inequality. Breaking down barriers is a good thing. No one should be held back by poverty or prejudice. But a good society cannot be premised only on the promise of escape. This is an important point. Improving our society relies on more than giving people opportunity to succeed. It's also about changing those values which direct people and allowing people to live their own version of success without prejudice or disparagement. Allowing everybody dignity, for example a decent income, whether it be in sanitation or politics, goes a long way. But an even more important thing to remember is that no person is self-made. When we talk about what we owe one another, we also have to talk about to what or to whom we owe our success. If the successful people in our society had a more lively sense of the contingency of their lot, as Sandel says, they might be more generous, more kind, and stand in solidarity with people who have not been as successful. To be able to walk a mile in someone else's shoes is not just to show you their perspective. It is to see yourself just one decision removed from your current destiny. I believe we owe one another that consideration. Meritocracy isn't bad any more than socialism, capitalism, and democracy are bad. All systems have their faults and their advantages. It is only when we blindly accept and embrace a system without thinking about the ramifications that it becomes overbearing. In my experience, people often talk about meritocracy like a panacea, the same way some people talk about universal basic income. That's why I made these videos on meritocracy specifically. To temper belief systems with one another is to make them more balanced, more flexible, more aware of the human perspective. Rarely does that end poorly. I believe in some level of intrinsic human worth, but even more strongly, I believe in humility in success and compassion for failure. And I think that one of the major traps of merit is that while it doesn't preclude these, it certainly doesn't inspire them. On a personal note, you watching this, your worth and what you think of yourself is important. And I know it's often said, but don't let your education, your job, your income determine how you treat yourself or how you allow yourself to be treated. Anyway, that's about enough from me. But as always, I want to give you something to go away with. In this case, it is John Steinbeck's Tortilla Flat, the author's first commercial success. The book follows the life of Danny and his growing group of friends. Steinbeck compares the house in which they live to the round table of King Arthur's court, because despite the friends differing wealth and ability, they share things and are all equal in the house. All the friends owe Danny for rent in some way or another, but he never collects it. Instead, to make it up to him, they gift him wine, food, and celebration, which are far less than the cost of the rent, and the friends rarely work, and only in order to buy wine as a gift for another, which they expect to have shared back with them when it is drunk. Together, the friends care for and exist alongside one another, in a vagrant and often alcoholic state, and beg, borrow, and steal to survive, and to keep one another happy. These friends have no money, no jobs, and little property or responsibility, and indeed they have no use for these things. Yet we can see simply by the fact that they care for each other that they all have worth to one another and compassion for one another. Indeed, the only point of tension they can be said to experience is that of caring for one another versus enhancing their own personal freedoms. Tortilla Flat can be a really uncomfortable read for people who live in societies like ours, 
which is odd because it's so deeply rudderless as a story. It illustrates in the extreme the opposite of so many ideas that meritocracy supports, and the social and cultural ties that have been formed because of it. It's quite a short book, and it's also a classic, you should definitely give it a read. These two videos obviously cover huge subjects, and there's so much I wanted to talk about but didn't have the time. Let me know if you want more videos like this, or if you have a topic you want me to cover. But for now, I hope you've all enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you again. If you did like this video, you can help me out by commenting below, sharing, or chucking me a like or subscribe, and letting me know what you think. Thanks so much for watching.